Uh, my name is McGee Young. I'm the founder and CEO of Walk Carbon. Um, I was fortunate enough to um, become involved with LF Energy uh, almost uh, from its beginning. Uh, I was part of uh, an, uh, the two of the first uh, six projects that got um, uh, submitted to LF Energy uh, for governance um, at my last company uh, at Recurve. The open EE meter um, still is going strong. Um, and, and I got to know Shuli Goodman, who was the founding executive director uh, pretty early on in, in her work. And uh, she said something to me that has stuck with me for since then. Uh, she said, McGee, our job here is to live in the future and to bring everybody else along with us. And so I titled this presentation, uh, Lessons from the Future, uh, sort of as, a, as an homage to, to Shuli, who passed away last year, um, but also to remind us that uh, the work that we're doing, uh, literally nobody else understands even what we're talking about. And so um, this is really the, the sort of um, cutting edge of, um, of hopefully achieving some pretty dramatic um, changes in the way that we organize our energy systems um, and, um, and fundamentally to solve some major problems that we face, uh, some challenges that we face um, and, and globally um, regarding climate change. Um, I also want to just say thanks to Alex and uh, Dan and all of the rest of the folks at LF Energy who organized this, uh, this conference. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's really amazing to see um, these different folks coming in uh, today and tomorrow, working on uh, such a variety of different types of projects, but also uh, the, the overlap <laughs> uh, between a lot of them. As I was uh, watching the, the presentations, uh, they were all stealing my thunder. So hopefully this isn't too redundant to a lot of the stuff that you've already heard, but maybe a little bit of a different take on some of these themes that have been uh, emerging today. Watt Carbon as a company is trying to build uh, the first environmental commodities market that focuses on decarbonizing buildings, the, just the built environment. 40% uh, of global emissions uh, come from our energy use. A lot of that has to do with how we power our grid. Uh, but as the last panel uh, pointed out, um, quite a bit of it happens in our buildings as well. The, um, the fuels that we burn to keep ourselves warm, uh, to heat our water, um, to turn our lights on. And, um, and if we're going to achieve our decarbonization goals collectively, um, we've got to figure out how to tackle that uh, part of our emissions problem. Uh, currently, we're on a pace to, to, to do this, um, which is the good news. The bad news is it's probably going to take us about 300 years uh, as we're going now. And, and even worse, uh, about $100 trillion. <laughs> uh, we've got probably 30 years uh, to get this done, and we can probably afford to spend $10 trillion. Uh, and so the question that we're trying to tackle at Watt Carbon is how do we improve both of those numbers by 90%? So we anchor on this, on this notion of 24-7. We've heard a lot about that today. Uh, and the question you know, we like to ask is, you know, why 24-7? What is so important about that particular metric? And to us, that, that, you know, that um, the 24-7 number is, is useful because it reminds us that our goal is a carbon-free energy system. Clean energy everywhere, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And um, this is this is going to be challenging, right? Uh, and all honestly, like we're gonna, it's we're gonna have our work cut out for us uh, to be able to meet this goal. We've got these ambitious decarbonization goals. Uh, how to get there is still uh, very much a work in progress. One of the one of the particular challenges, and there was a question uh, raised about this earlier, is. Um, so when we think about hourly energy, uh, hourly clean energy procurement, um, we know when the sun shines, 
We know when the wind blows uh, for the most part. Sometimes it's cloudy and sometimes it's not windy, so that throws a wrench in our efforts. But uh, we also know more or less when those things aren't happening. Uh, and pretty consistently, the sun doesn't shine um, and the wind doesn't blow uh, around the, the times at which the sun is coming up or going down in the day. So, um, and, and because we are, us humans, have adapted a lifestyle that where we wake up when the sun comes up and we kind of go to, you know, start winding down for the day when the sun goes down, we tend to use a lot of electricity during those particular times of day. So, so for us, like, the, the kind of macro challenge is, uh, yeah, we can build a lot of solar panels that'll, you know, provide us with power in the middle of the day, and we can build a lot more windmills that'll power us, you know, overnight. But what do we do uh, during those times of day, every single day, uh, when we don't have those renewables online? these peak demand periods. And, and this for us is where distributed energy resources uh, play a big role. And where we see the, the market heading uh, into the future uh, is to be able to start to create market infrastructure around distributed energy resources. Uh, when I have to go talk about this to like regular people, uh, we talk about this as kind of like wrecks, but for buildings. Uh, so if you imagine the, the kind of, um, procurement that we do for clean energy today for big wind and solar projects, what if we could do that for your thermostat or the battery you put in, in your house um, or the energy efficiency uh, that you've, um, the insulation you've put into your attic? If you think about it, energy efficiency is just kind of like solar at night from an energy standpoint. Uh, so how do we value that? How do we transact it? And most fundamentally, how do we invest in it? How do we deploy the $10 trillion of capital that we need uh, to be able to achieve these goals in the time period that we set out for ourselves. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, um, this question of, of meeting peak demand with clean energy, which seems above everything else uh, the, 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 the most significant problem that we're going to face. So the way that we think about this is that um, we've got clean energy markets that exist. We've got carbon offset markets that exist. Uh, neither of those really addresses this issue of this opportunity of distributed energy resources. So for us, the 24-7 the framework is a starting place. That's, that's how we value uh, distributed energy resources. But this framework needs to en uh, encompass both supply and demand. We have to understand the value of reducing consumption during certain times of day or increasing consumption during certain times of day as much as we value the production of clean energy in the first place. So as we think about this, we think about three kind of key dimensions to a reimagined energy system. Distributed energy resources, grid interactive demand, and inclusive energy markets. So historically, we've relied upon centralized power generation. Back in the day, we built a power plant. That power plant would, would go up and down uh, in terms of its production based on how much demand uh, was, was required at, the, at that time of day. So we would ramp up the old coal plant, or you know, nowadays the natural gas peaker plant when everybody got home uh, and started turning on their lights. Uh, today's grid uh, relies a lot more on distributed uh, power generation. We see the data coming out of KISO, for example, in the middle of the day where the preponderance of residential solar just eviscerates the, the middle of the day load uh, that the grid has to serve. And on top of that, we've got a, a whole bunch of, of solar that's being produced uh, during the middle of the day, uh, utility scale solar. And so the grid operator is having to sell that, so have, is asking Oregon uh, to turn off its hydro uh, dam so that it can take our solar power uh, off, of, off of our hands. So grid operators now are dealing with this combination of both centralized power generation and distributed power generation. Whereas before, the, most of the job of the grid operator was delivering energy supply, it was delivering energy reliably, um, supplying energy. Uh, nowadays, it's trying to orchestrate uh, demand and supply. Well, that's a much, you know, that, the, the math required for orchestration is significantly more complicated uh, than the math um, for just delivering energy, but potentially very valuable to the, to the grid operator, to the extent that they can harness what we nowadays call virtual power plants to orchestrate 
demand so that it can, can complement supply um, is now seen as actually part of the next wave of our energy systems. And for the most part, historically, we've had, uh, we saw earlier today the, the panel that talking about EACs and energy markets, RECs, as it were, um, are uh, a legacy uh, product in many ways that we've, we've always thought, well, what matters is a megawatt hour of clean generation, uh, but really all generation and all savings matters in this new grid world. And so collectively, those distributed power generation, the ability to orchestrate supply and demand, and valuing as clean energy attributes all forms of generation and savings become the way in which our new energy system is going to be reimagined and operated and, and how we're going to get to the carbon goals that we set for ourselves. Okay, how do we do this? Okay, so we think of three really important components uh, to this new 24 seven clean energy system. So first, data infrastructure. Um, we've got to have, and I think this is a theme that has emerged throughout the day, uh, data platforms with consistent measurement, uh, reporting, uh, especially with distributed energy resources where you have um, calculated values like energy efficiency and demand response which require a counterfactual. Um, we've got to be able to have consistency and transparency across data systems so that we can, and interoperability so that these things can be harmonized uh, with each other. Second, market infrastructure. We currently have uh, very limited ways of transacting uh, clean energy. Has anybody here ever tried to buy a REC? Like it's like really hard uh, to figure out how to like just like basically buy clean energy. Like how would I do this? And, and um, and so that, you know, you, if you're a, let's, you're a company and, and you, you know, you've now appointed a sustainability person who's probably like a, you know, an English major who just like ran the environmental club and is like excited about this and you're saying, okay, hey, you got to go buy Rex. And they're like, I don't even know where to start. Uh, to, and, the, and now it's like, you got to go buy hourly Rex. And you got to do it like Google does it. And, um, and the, so the bar there is, in, is incredibly high and the opacity of the current system um, is a, is a massive disincentive. So, um, so if we're going to raise the bar in terms of our expectations, we have to enable uh, more participants to be successful. And then third is the capital infrastructure. Um, we've seen uh, something like 70% of new wind and solar that came online last year in the United States was underwritten by a corporate PPA or VPPA. That's an amazing success story, and many of these corporations are following the lead of, of those who you saw on the stage earlier today, uh, making real commitments to either 100% renewable energy or to 24-7 um, carbon-free energy. Um, but those same uh, pathways to corporate impact that exist for large-scale renewable projects, the, the, you know, even, even putting, um, I forget exactly what the investment was into the fusion, uh, project, but it, uh, presumably it's that, collectively, that's going to be billions of dollars that we put into developing those new types of resources. Those same pathways don't exist for the types of projects that were just being talked about in the last panel. If we want to go put in a, a heat pump into a low-income house, the, and you, if, you have, if, you, if you're trying to finance a heat pump project, and you're low income, for the same heat pump that can go to somebody paying cash for maybe $15,000, the total cost for you is gonna be something like $45,000 because of the cost of finance. And we go to people and we say, hey, you need to decarbonize. You need to make these investments into your own buildings. By the way, if you can't pay cash, you're gonna pay three times the sticker price. People look at you like, you're insane. Why would I give up my vacation to Walt Disney World with my kids so I can put in some dumb heat pump that's gonna cost me extra and make my bills go up? We have to do a much better job of thinking about how we're actually taking this all the way to the, to the last mile, right? To the end, to the people, to the, the 115 million buildings in this country that we're asking to decarbonize, make it possible to fund and finance those types of projects the same way that we do large-scale renewable energy projects. 
In our mind, uh, a clean energy system is a distributed energy system. Those two things are going to go hand in hand. The great thing about a distributed energy system is that there's no interconnection queue. We can do this today. So, let's go. <laughs> that was my graphic designer that just had to have that in there, so. <laughs> um, I did not do that myself, just to be clear, <laughs> beyond my abilities. Uh, in August of last year, uh, we, we said, okay, what would this look like? What would it look like to actually have a, a, a market for distributed energy, for, for clean energy EACs? Um, we didn't even know what to call them at the time. We were, uh, the first couple of iterations of our work with our lawyers to get all this set up, we were calling them KECs, clean energy credits. And, uh, and finally, we were, we were like, ah, this not, doesn't feel right. And we went back to the, to the greenhouse gas protocols where they called them EACs in the GHG protocols. And so we're like, all right, we're going to go with energy attribute certificates. And, um, and then think, thankfully, the Department of Energy did the same thing with the 45V uh, guidelines and, and others have been following along. So this, I'm like sort of like one of those relief moments where you make this decision as a founder to go with a particular terminology and then, and then the rest of the world decides that that was the right one to use. Um, so I want to talk through, so this was like kind of crazy, right, in a, in a way. We didn't have like a partner, like a, you know, like a, a, a big uh, buyer or anything ahead of time. It was just all done basically for the learning of this. Like what would it actually take uh, to run a market, to build a market from the ground up? And, um, and I think that there's a lot that came out of it that's really interesting to share with all of you, and, and obviously um, we want to share it with the whole world. Um, but they, it falls under sort of four main um, pieces of, of learnings. Uh, so the data platform, uh, measurement and verification, uh, what does it take to build a new market and access to capital? These were the four kind of themes that emerged from, uh, from our, our pilot. By the way, we, we went out and procured 1,000 megawatt hours of rooftop solar from, uh, uh, roof from projects that were being built in West Virginia, solar projects in West Virginia, one of the dirtiest grids in the country. Uh, we procured 1,000 megawatt hours of demand response in California, cutting uh, some energy use during the, the dirtiest times of day in the California grid. Demand response that was being bid into CAISO as an energy resource, but for which there's no existing REC out there to be able to value it for its environmental benefits. Um, and 1,000 tons of CO2 emission reduction from heat pump projects being de uh, developed by companies like Block Power um, elephant energy out in Colorado, um, quick carbon on the, on the West Coast, um, to allow those companies to go to their customers with a better deal, a lower price uh, for, their, um, for their systems, to cross that chasm between uh, theory and reality where we're actually getting folks to adopt these because it's price, price competitive. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about wheats, so we had to build our own registry uh, because existing rec registries kind of looked at us and laughed. The carbon offset um, registries don't, don't really understand or appreciate the value of distributed energy. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the measurement and verification piece of this is complicated. We'll talk about the Open EAC Alliance. Um, we built a marketplace. Uh, that's hard, <laughs> newsflash. Um, uh, but a lot of really interesting learnings um, out of that. And then the, the biggest piece is the access to capital. So we've been building what we call VPPAs for DERs uh, to help fund and finance uh, these projects going into people's houses. Um, so, so let me start with a, with a system of record um, this, um, that we had to build. So it, the Watt Carbon Energy Attribute Tracking System is what wheat stands for, although we like to make jokes about eating our Wheaties. Um, what's the, so, so we talked a little bit about this earlier today. Uh, what's the importance of a system of record? An EAC is a legal contract, is a legal, is a property right. Uh, so you have um, a lot of REC, uh, renewable energy credits, um, are transferred outside of a, a registry nowadays. Um, it's just a bilateral contract between two parties. One party gives the other party the legal authority to, to own the environmental attributes. Um, and um, oftentimes it's just sort of like uh, retired without uh, being listed on a, on a registry. The registries historically, as, as was mentioned, 
uh, were for the purposes of, um, of, state, of, of state renewable portfolio standards. Um, there's no necessarily reason uh, to use a registry except for double counting, uh, except for making you know credible claims, um, except for you know the the uh, longevity of, of the data. Um, so um, we're of the belief. So we did this for the for the for the pilot Sans registry. Uh, we just had these contracts and it felt pretty sketchy uh, to be honest. Um, but we couldn't get anybody to like you know actually like they were like we can't do that. We we can't do. We we asked uh, Energy Tag. Uh, hey, can we use your standard uh, for, and they're like, no, we don't do demand side, you know, energy resources, it's all generation uh, that, and, and so, we, so we had to kind of start from scratch uh, to say, how do we build a system of record that's inclusive of all types of energy resources? So that had to be hourly energy tracking anywhere in the world, um, inclusive of, of all resources, generation and, and, and savings, and serialized at the watt hour which means every single watt hour of electricity gets a unique serial number. Think about that for a second. That, that, it's, a, it's a little bit of a mind boggling, uh, like that, that, light, that really bright one that's, that's shining in my eyes right there is, you know, who knows, it could be a, a 100 watt uh, light, just that one light. So we're gonna use millions of, of, of watt hours of, uh, of energy in this building today. Um, each one of those gets a particular uh, it gets a serial number that's attached to a set of attributes. And those attributes, um, including things like deliverability, incrementality, temporality, carbon intensity, social benefits, are all the things that you care about when you're procuring energy. So for any given watt hour, there's going to be, and some people are going to care about some attributes versus other attributes. Uh, the 24-7, those who are trying to achieve a 24-7 goal are going to care what hour and what grid this energy c came from. Those uh, pursuing an emissionality goal are going to care about the carbon emissions impact of that watt hour of electricity. And others who are, are, who are trying to procure uh, clean energy from, uh, from like West Virginia uh, or from, you know, like a poor neighborhood are going to care about the social benefits. Uh, and so each watt hour then is going to have any number of attributes uh, associated with it that uh, and, and so that's the, the purpose of the registry, right, is to both, you know, give each watt hour a, a serial number, as well as then associate it with a set of attributes that it can that can be used to help um, to create the value behind it. Um, the second problem that we had, uh, this was supposed to be a build. I think I forgot to build this one. Um, was okay. You've got um, energy efficiency. If anybody here comes from the m and world, I know uh, in the last panel there's somebody who came from that world. It's, uh, it's, it's a complicated business to be in because uh, you know, if, we t if we turned off the lights in this building, suddenly uh, you know, we might save energy, but we, how much energy does that save? Well, it's relative to what would have happened, so it's a counterfactual. And there are different ways of calculating this counterfactual. Uh, the example that we used from the pilot was with respect to demand response. So uh, for the pilot, we partnered with a demand response company that was um, bidding into CAISO, the California grid. Uh, and so CAISO was recognized, was calculating that demand response value based on an official formula that they have. Um, it's called a 5 and 10 baseline. and it's. Um, Pretty mediocre, frankly, in terms of like the quality of the counterfactual that, that you get. And since um, I was, you know, part of the Open EE meter, which creates a much higher f fidelity counterfactual, we were like, we should use the better formula for this to get a more accurate number. So we calculated our own demand response uh, number and um, got a different number than Kaiso got. And the question was, who's right? And not the question of who's better, the question is who's right. And, um, and Kaiso's right, like, at the, like duh, like, you're right, like it doesn't matter if you have a, like a better number or not, it's the assist, there's a system of record for the energy value that exists. And so for, for our thinking on this was like, okay, so actually the point here is not to get sort of be the like world's like oracle of, you know, how to do this stuff like the best possible way, 
but actually to provide the transparency and the visibility for the market into exactly how the number was derived that you're using to represent the impact of the unit of energy that, you're, uh, that you have an, an EAC uh, built around. And so we, we realized that, uh, that we c there's no go it alone strategy with respect to the vetting of different kinds of methodologies, that this uh, needs to happen uh, collectively. And there, there's an entire measurement and verification community of, of professionals who do this. And so we've, um, we've formed, coming out of the, the pilot and our experience kind of working with partners on this, we realized it was important to kind of formalize this. Um, and this tracks with a lot of the work that we do in the, in the carbon data specification, uh, where we bring um, a, uh, a set of stakeholders together to kind of vet and, and work on methodologies together. Um, obviously, for, uh, for this, it's a little bit more focused on energy methodologies. We're doing this a little bit separately, but we've created the Open EAC Alliance uh, as a way to make sure that the claims that are being made for the EACs that are being generated are being reviewed independently by, uh, by third parties. In fact, uh, so here at the, the big reveal uh, early, was that we're having a kickoff meeting for this Open EAC Alliance um, happening on May 16th. Um, and so anybody who's interested in that is, is uh, encouraged to, uh, to join. And you can go to openeac.org uh, to learn more. OK, I want to talk now about the marketplace. Um, so this was, uh, this was really the kind of uh, big unknown, is how do you actually create a marketplace from scratch? Uh, what are the attributes that matter? Uh, should we uh, sell these based on the hour of the day in which they occur? occur? Should we aggregate them uh, together so that they're big enough? You know, you don't want to sell individual watt hour EECs, like the amount of like clicking that you have to do for that is, is, um, is, is too much. Um, how do you price uh, EACs? Uh, we, uh, we set the price, <laughs> was the answer. Uh, just out of, you know, we sort of talked with our suppliers and the partners and I said, like, what's a good enough price to get you to want to do this in the first place? And, um, and as a company, we said, we'll take the risk on this, right? We'll, we'll pre-purchase these EACs from you so that you have the confidence that the market will deliver and then we're going to go try to sell these to the market and see you know, who, who would be a taker um, at that price. The, the, the challenge that we, that we ran into was that all of these buyers look, wanted different things. Uh, some of them wanted time of the day. Some of them wanted carbon impact. Some of them wanted social impact. And so we needed to be able to create standardization and flexibility at the same time. And at the end of the day, we're going to have to figure out how to make, how to, you know, we can't set the price forever, right? So how do these markets clear in an organic way? But the thing that, that jumped out to us that I think probably took me by the most surprise was that from the buyer side, these are mostly corporates with net zero goals. So maybe this is a little bit of a biased um, sample, but more than anything else, they wanted to be able to prove impact. How can I go to my stakeholders, whether it's my carbon accountants, uh, my board of directors, um, regulators, and say, that was a thing that I did. I need to have the paper trail to be able to prove that the action that I took had the intended consequence. And so I think with any marketplace, this is going to be really important, that you're able to kind of have some way to demonstrate that the action that you took had the impact in the world that you're trying to claim. Maybe it's just enhancing the market value or it's, it's contributing to the deployment of new clean energy, uh, something there, but the impact story, the reason why we do this in the first place is for the decarbonization potential of these resources. Um, and so at the end of the day, we have to, we have to um, prove that we're doing this. So we went out and, and worked with a bunch of, uh, of suppliers. And, and so if you think about who are these, who are, you know, where does the supply come from? In this, in this marketplace. Who are the companies out there that would, uh, that would you know, it, it's easy to think of like on the, on the large wind and, you know, wind and solar, you've got like the next era energies of the world, Clearway, uh, these big, you know, these big companies, these big renewable developers, but on the distributed side, it's a whole different cast of characters. Um, it's, you know, Leap doing demand response. It's, uh, 
correlate building uh, solar panels on, on in commercial industrial uh, buildings. It's block power uh, putting heat pumps into uh, uh, multifamily apartment buildings. Uh, solar hauler putting, putting solar panels onto homes in West Virginia. These are the, this is the, the these, we call these project developers, um, become the way in which we access that, um, that distributed energy market. We like to say um, every watt hour tells a story. <laughs> uh, as we started to think about this question of, of aggregation and disaggregation, uh, we realized that you know, one of the really compelling ways in which you can uh, procure clean energy from distributed energy resources is to be connected to the stories behind how these how these things got deployed in the first place? How did we get? How do we end up with solar hauler putting renewables in coal country? How did we get uh, battery storage in Texas deployed where there's no upfront cost to the end customer and they get free resilience in exchange for the dispatch uh, into the grid on a daily basis? How do we get efficiency improvements in public schools? And these are the these are the the attributes of an EAC. This is why we use the term EAC, is for every watt hour, we're gonna have a story behind it. A story around additionality, a story behind deliverability, which is what, what grid is this coming from? Uh, behind incrementality, how, how recent is this project that you're buying these EACs from? What time of day did this happen? Uh, what was the social impact? Was it a PPA, a VPPA? Did somebody finance them, themselves? What type of contract exists? Uh, what methodology did you use to, to understand the impacts of these, of these projects? Was it solar? Was it battery? Um, what were the environmental impacts? What were the carbon savings? All of these attributes become attached to the resources and help uh, tell those stories. I mentioned bundling and unbundling. I think this is a really interesting. So as we kind of look, as we look ahead to what comes next, uh, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of like a million devices coming online in our registry right now. And I think about the challenge of this 24-7 mapping to your, to your load. And one of the things that occurred to us was that um, like you can't build uh, solar panels that only produce during certain hours of the day, right? So like your, your ability to I mean, you can kind of direct the panels towards like the east or something, so it mostly picks up the afternoon or the morning sun or the pointing to the west to get the, but generally speaking, those, those are assets are sort of fixed. They just produce uh, what they produce. And, um, and, so you, and so you want to be able to, uh, to think about like, how am I disaggregating those assets so that I can uh, correlate with them with different kinds of use cases? So if I have, for example, like a battery, and some solar panels attached to that battery. I'm gonna use some of that energy during the middle of the day uh, for, my, for whatever I'm using it for. Maybe I'm just sending it back to the grid or whatever, but I'm gonna use some of it to charge the battery. And so I need to be able to disaggregate the EACs that come off of that solar panel and associate some one set of those EACs with the battery that gets charged and another set of those EACs with the load that it's being matched to. Uh, and be able to know which one is which. And, as, and if I take a little bit of power from the grid at the same time, I need to be able to track that as well. So the, the complexity of these, um, of these systems is, um, I think, something that we've started to wrap our heads around, like how uh, important it's going to be to have, um, have good record keeping. Uh, I would say one, one thing that we, um, that we shifted our thinking on after doing the pilot. As I mentioned, we, we procured 1,000 tons of CO2 reductions from heat pump projects. Um, that belies a very complicated um, set of assumptions about how do you know how many tons were reduced from a heat pump project? And you have this problem of like, well, you've reduced natural gas consumption, so that's, you know, but you've also increased electricity consumption. And th this is sort of an apples and oranges thing because you're reducing natural gas consumption on site. That's a scope one emission for those of you who are carbon accountants. 
Uh, and, but you've increased your electricity usage, which is a scope two emission. This, this is the kind of the same problem with hydrogen, though, to be honest, or, or any sort of new load that's coming online that's replacing um, a, a dirty load that's, that's electrifying. This electrification movement is, is creates challenges for carbon accounting. So we've decided to, that <laughs> um, sticking with the watt hour as the unit of the EAC reduces the chances of confusion. Uh, so you're not dealing with tons, tons of CO2 on one hand and units of electricity on the other hand. And for a heat pump, you have watt hours of effect of what's called in the, in the heat pumps, uh, the heat pump people call useful heat. So you can measure useful heat in terms of watt hours. Um, and then you have uh, flexibility then in your attributes. So you have consistency in your unit of measurement, flexibility in your attributes. So that useful heat kilowatt hour or watt hour um, associated with a heat pump will have a different set of attributes than a, than a watt hour associated with a solar panel, uh, for example. And so as we start to mature these markets, it's going to be important that we have consensus around even what our units of transaction are and how we refer to them. The, another challenge that we faced was um, <laughs> buyers going, I'd like to buy, you know, like five years in the future worth of this thing. And, and you're like, well, really like the, it's a 10 year, you know, value. Like, you know, we're gonna put, you're gonna want, they want additionality, right? So they were like, we'd like to help like, you know, fund these solar panels, but we only want to buy the first five years of their production. And like, that doesn't quite move the needle for the owner, the, the developer of the solar panels to only get like five years worth. Um, so, um, so we need to have this ability to, to sort of like buy long term, but maybe buy the whole 20 years, uh, but then be able to flip that into a spot market. Maybe I've bought too much. Maybe I've um, under procured. So this kind of connection between a forward market where I can buy a long, you know, long term um, that helps to su support the deployment of these resources in the first place, and then a spot market where I can um, trade back and forth with other, other buyers um, allows for liquidity, allows for kind of the speculation, the risk taking, um, so that like right now I could lock in a fairly low long-term price, knowing that the prices are gonna likely rise for renewable um, energy, for EACs. Um, but then down the road, if like I end up having procured too much or I do a lot of energy efficiency in my own building so I don't need as many, then I know that I have some way of, of mitigating that risk by loading that back into um, more of a spot market. And the last thing that I'll say about the marketplace is it's gonna take a while for prices to stabilize. We're still working with buyers and sellers on both sides. Our, our uh, approach kind of going forward as, as we um, have unveiled the new version of our marketplace is to let the sellers uh, set the price that they wanna get and then let the buyers kind of come in and evaluate, just like you would do with like an Airbnb. Whereas an Airbnb you know, uh, owner you say, hey, this is $400 a night, uh, it's got, but it's got a hot tub, and you know, those are the attributes associated with it. Um, but if nobody ends up renting it out, then maybe you gotta go down to 300. Uh, so we think that that's the right way to, to allow prices to stabilize, but uh, time will tell on that front. Uh, the last thing I'll say is 24-7 is procurement is possible today. Everybody thinks about this as something that'll happen in the future, but um, we just, we just did our first deal uh, for 24-7 procurement from a buyer uh, who um, was motivated by the three pillars test. Uh, we're not, you know, they're not gonna fully get it yet because these are small scale uh, projects, but the three pillars test of deliverability, time matching, and, and incrementality um, is starting to take hold in the, in the, in the markets and uh, folks are think, asking themselves, if I really wanna be net zero, I think I need to be following that higher bar. Um, and we were able to put together a set of resources for them that met that, um, met that bar for them. So I think this kind of stuff is happening. It is, it is, it is possible. It is still a little bit complicated. Um, we just don't have enough liquidity yet generally to be able to do this, but I think it is, um, it's on the horizon. Last thing, we've got um, five minutes left. I imagine six minutes left I, is what I think. And uh, a little fruit fly here. <laughs> Uh, the fruit fly is telling me it's, it's bar o'clock. So uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with the, the last piece of this, uh, what we call VPPAs uh, for DERs. 
Now we don't have, it's not really a VPPA in the sense if you guys have, have, have done this type of work before where it's like a contract for differences uh, kind of a thing. Uh, but the principle is the same. So if, you, if you're doing big wind and solar procurement um, and you sign a VPPA, what you're saying is that we're gonna, to the lender, you're saying we're gonna guarantee a fixed rate of payment for the energy that comes off of this system for the next 20-ish years. And we as the buyer will take the risk on the market for that energy. And we're gonna assume that hopefully uh, the, market will, the market rate for that energy will be above the strike price that we've agreed to to pay for, the, pay for that coming off of the panels. Um, interestingly, uh, nowadays, um, I'm not, this is not, we don't do a lot of this, but from what I've heard is that's actually, um, for the most part now, people are paying extra for clean energy with their VPPAs than what the market uh, rate for that electricity would be. So you're, um, so these are hard to get, uh, these v from large scale solar and wind projects and interconnection queues have made that challenge even more difficult. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's what allows that solar panel or that wind farm uh, to get built, uh, to get financed by the bank is that there's a corporation with a large balance sheet who has said, yes, we promise to buy that energy from this system for its, for its lifetime. Uh, with DERs, it's a much different story. Uh, now it's, it's personal credit that's on the line. It's the ability of, of it's the recourse for non-payment where uh, the lender looks at that and they go, I don't know how exactly I'm gonna go like repossess your solar panels or repossess your heat pump or the, take the insulation back out of your attic uh, that we put in there if you don't pay for this finance. And so what they do is they put that risk onto the borrower. They put that risk onto us. And we pay you know, somewhere between 12 and 16% on average interest rates right now for financed uh, clean energy projects at the distributed level. That's both at the household level and at the commercial level. And, so, and that cost of capital is one of the biggest barriers to deployment uh, that exists today. This is the purpose behind the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is to help reduce some of those costs but a much more significant reduction of those costs can come from the pre-purchase of the EACs for these projects by the corporation that can get levered into the finance stack. So what we do is we shift the risk from the end customer to the, to the net zero procurement. And if all goes well, that net zero procurement ends up, the whole thing ends up getting paid off it looks just like a regular old VPPA contract for differences where, where you come out basically even, but you've substantially reduced the cost for the owner. This reduces the cost for the end user by about 50%. And so we see the ability for corporate America, in particular those who have it, uh, net zero goals that really wanna make a big impact, to change the finance stack for distributed energy re resources and use those EACs not just as a way to meet their energy goals, which obviously for 24-7 purposes, for um, emissionality purposes um, are important, but to reinvest in their communities as well, uh, to put money back onto the table of homeowners who are trying to do the right thing, to build jobs in their communities doing heat pumps, doing solar panels, installing batteries, building resilience in the face of climate change as we try to grapple with the specter of higher and higher temperatures. So for us as Watt Carbon, we're hopeful that you know, over the next you know, five to 10 years, we can deploy, we can double or triple the pace of DER deployment underwritten by these commitments to buying the environmental attributes and amplifying the work that's being done by those, by those and many other companies that I showed earlier who are on the front lines of trying to achieve those, uh, our, our clean energy goals by, um, by doing DER projects in our, in our houses. So I've got one minute left. We've got drinks waiting for us. If there's a burning question, I'll answer it here. Otherwise, we can take it into the, um, into the lobby there. Yes.
So the question is, how do you handle adjustments uh, to EACs after they've been transacted? Yep. Uh, so you're so you're saying, for example, if we um, had calculated some uh, some production from a solar panel, realized that that uh, data was wrong or something like that, um, but it had already you know been transacted, and so what do you do? There's a our our approach to this is to delay the issuance, the final issuance of that for 60 days to account for adjustments. It also allows the other attributes to catch up, like the carbon emissions intensity of the grid. Um, post 60 days, it's sort of like, there's, it's a very difficult and you know, would love to engage with you know, people who have better ideas of this, with this than I am, but we're hopefully that that buffer is going to be sufficient for the market to be able to uh, organize around it. No, it's, it's the unit of energy. That's the, uh, the point I was making earlier, is that I think we have to standardize on the watt hour as what we're transacting, because not everybody wants, not everybody cares about the carbon, not everybody agrees, as, as um, the earlier panel was discussing, you know, are you using marginal emissions or average emissions or some other emissions? Um, and, and so I think that has to be, those are attributes that can be selected for in the procurement, but at the end of the, end of the day, these are, units of energy that are being procured because we can standardize around that. Yeah. Agreed. Impossible, in fact. <laughs> or, I mean, at least <laughs> maybe some AI if, if some company could figure that out, but that for us we thought was, was not possible. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody, for a great uh, day uh, sticking around. Um, thanks, Alex.